A reading from Psalm 113. How good and how pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like fine oil upon the head, flowing down upon the beard, upon the beard of Aaron, flowing down upon the collar of his robe. It is like the dew of Hermon, flowing down upon the hills of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. A reading of excerpts from Genesis 37 and 45. Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien, the land of Canaan. This is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. <clears throat> he was a helper to the sons of Bilha and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he had made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Come now. Let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels carrying gum, balm, and resin on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. The reading continues from book 45, after Judah had offered himself in place of his brother Benjamin. Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry, and go up to my father, and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, and your children, and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have will provide for you there. Since there are five more years of famine to come, 
so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And now your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my own mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father how greatly I am honored in Egypt and all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, while Benjamin wept upon his neck, and he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Sisters and brothers, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you rather be Joseph or his brothers? In other words, would you rather be the forgiver or the forgiven? Joseph is, as we've heard, his father's favorite. At age 17, his father marks him as the favorite by giving him a pretty robe, which doesn't sound so bad, but a robe with long sleeves, long droopy sleeves, means that it's awfully hard to do any kind of manual labor, which means that Joseph is probably going to get to sit around dreaming his dreams while his brothers do all the work. Not really the way to win friends and influence people, but at 17, maybe Joseph hasn't really had a chance to read that book yet. Um, and in any case, um, he decides to rub it in the face of his brothers and tells them all about all of his dreams. He says, I dreamed that you would all bow down to me one day. Well, his brothers are not exactly thrilled by this, and so they plot revenge. First, they decided they were going to kill him, but eventually they decided, rather than having the blood of murdering him on their hands, they would instead just throw him in a pit. They weren't going to just outright kill him. They were going to throw him in a pit and leave him for dead. But then one of them had this brilliant thought, you know, if we sold him, not only would we not have killed him, but we'd have a little bit of money too. And so that's what they did. They sold him to the Ishmaelites. And the Ishmaelites were, if you remember Ishmael from the last couple of weeks, their cousins. In fact, great Eleanor and I figured this out. We sat down and did a family tree and we figured out that these are their second cousins. If you follow the family tree of the, um, of the book of Genesis. So these are their second cousins. They sell them, sell him to their cousins and the Ishmaelites then take him to Egypt and sell him to Potiphar, who is Pharaoh's captain of the guard. While he's there, there's a long story in between um, these two chapters. While he's there, Joseph captures the attention of Potiphar, and he rises to become overseer of Potiphar's house. And that's great for him. This is a great move of good fortune for him. But unfortunately, he also captures the attention of Potiphar's wife, who likes him a little too much. And when he rejects her advances, she tells Potiphar that he has insulted her. Joseph has insulted her. And so Potiphar throws Joseph into prison. While he's in prison, two of Pharaoh's servants come in, be, get put into prison, and they learn of Joseph's ability to interpret dreams. And he helps them to interpret their dreams in hope that then when they are released, they will come and release him as well. Unfortunately, that does not happen, and he winds up getting forgotten and left in prison for some time. But eventually, Pharaoh himself has a series of dreams, and these dreams need interpreting, and nobody can interpret them. So the servant remembers Joseph and brings Joseph to the Pharaoh, and Joseph interprets the dreams and wins Pharaoh's favor. And after a while, he has done so well that he winds up being Pharaoh's second in command. Um, Pharaoh's dreams interpret 
when, when they were interpreted, Pharaoh's dreams turned out to be about a coming famine. And because of his interpretation, Joseph is put in charge of storing up all of the grain and all of the supplies for this coming famine. So by the time we get to chapter 45, when Joseph's brothers come back into the picture, Joseph is second in command to Pharaoh and in charge of all of Egypt. He has control of all of the wealth, all the food, all the land. And when famine strikes, it doesn't just strike in Egypt, it strikes in Canaan as well. And the brothers are sent by Jacob, their father, to find food. And they come to Egypt looking to buy grain from Pharaoh and bring it back. And they don't recognize the guy who is sitting there in front of them, Pharaoh's second in command, their brother Joseph. Joseph, however, recognizes them. And instead of offering forgiveness, he begins by seeking revenge. He begins to repeat the cycle of recriminations. He throws them in prison. He condemns them as spies. He basically sets them up to suffer the way that he suffered, to be victims the way that he was a victim. Eventually, Joseph stashes his own cup, silver cup, in his brother's sack so that he can accuse them of stealing. And he brings them back and he throws them in prison. Because forgiveness, it turns out, is hard. So would we rather be the forgiver or the forgiven? Forgiveness is hard, and the choice between being the forgiver or the forgiven is not as easy as it might sound at first. At first, you might think, well, I'd rather be the one receiving forgiveness because I didn't get hurt in the first place, or I'd rather be the one offering forgiveness because now I am in a position to be in some power and control of the situation. But for many of us, forgiveness is just hard to find, whatever, wherever side we're on it. We want to forgive, but we can't really find it often within ourselves to do the forgiving. And the pain of whatever the harm was might be too close to us, or it might be that we are worried about being re-injured, um, that forgiving somebody might put us too close to that person again, and they might hurt us again. And so, Really, forgiveness often gets set aside for something that's a little easier, like revenge. And Joseph's brothers know this. They know that revenge is a common, a common thing. And they sit around in prison and they wonder to themselves, what if Joseph still bears a grudge against us? What if he decides that he's going to pay us back in full for all the wrong that we did him? And, of course, we who are reading think, yeah. What if he does? You guys deserve whatever you get. You did this awful thing to him. You sold him into slavery. You tried to kill him. And then instead of killing him, you only didn't kill him because you saw profit in it for yourself. So yeah, you guys get what you deserve, whatever you get. If he has revenge, that's on you. And so we watch and we wait through the rest of the story, as Joseph begins to get his revenge and the brothers are suffering. And we expect that this story will end with comeuppance. And it will be satisfying if that happens, because that is how a story should end. Like in real life, we know that the story should have a happy ending. And the happy ending would be for the people who did wrong to get what's coming to them. And the person who didn't do wrong to have that revenge, that sense of catharsis. But of course, Joseph was not completely innocent himself. He was not a great guy in the first place. He was a braggart. He was taking advantage of his father's favor of him. He was happy to sit around and be lazy and tell his brothers everything that they were wrong, doing wrong. And so really the nuance of it all is not really as nice as that simple Somebody did something wrong, they get their comeuppance. Somebody did not do something wrong, they get their revenge. In real life, 
we know that revenge is often bittersweet because it is nuanced. No one winds up being happy for long with revenge. Instead, we get caught up in a cycle because we seek revenge and then the other person thinks, oh, that revenge was too much. And so they seek revenge. And then we think, oh, no, that was over overdoing it. So then we, you know, and we wind up in this cycle, this repeating cycle of accusation and injury and revenge until we wind up actually being ruled by the sins of the past and the sins of our fathers become the sins of the, uh, the sons. And we are refighting wars that we have long since had over, suffering for damage long done. And because we've never really dealt with the forgiveness that was necessary instead of the revenge that we sought, and since we've never really dealt with what the harm was in the first place, we can't move on. We can't move forward. And this, this then puts us to the position of the forgiven, the one who worries that revenge is always just around the corner. What about the one who is worried about that past guilt that will lead to future suffering? The one who's always looking over their shoulder for the past to sneak up on us and bite us. The one who knows that they've never really fully repented for what was done in the past. We've never really had it out and talked about why was what was done was wrong and why we need to change that system, whatever that might be, so that we can move forward into a new kind of day. And so sin and guilt haunt us and they make us feel unforgivable, unworthy, unfit for anything but this repeated cycle of destruction, whether we're the forgiver or the forgiven. When we're faced with the past, we feel ourselves to be ripe for this cycle of revenge and somehow deserving of punishment or entitled to nothing but wrath and regret, whether it's our wrath or the wrath of someone else. If we are the ones who are doing the forgiving, we might feel that all that we have in front of us is the wrath of of our harm, the, the thing that we have done that we want to to dwell on and that becomes all that we're about is that that need for revenge and if we're the one being forgiven then we find that we ourselves all we become is that thing that we've done in the past this this is what humans tend to do with sin and guilt and forgiveness whether the forgiven or the forgiven forgiveness is a struggle and it often becomes a tool in a power game it becomes the tail that wags the dog and turns our attention away from the real human lives that are caught up in these cycles of guilt and recrimination. The real human lives that are being oppressed or ignored. But finally, finally here at the end of Joseph's story, God shows up. In Joseph's words, God shows up, and now this human story about retribution and revenge becomes God's story. A story about forgiveness and reconciliation. Joseph somehow, through God, somehow manages to set aside that recrimination and revenge story and realizes that what God, what the brothers intended for harm, God has used for a new kind of ending. Through Joseph, through broken, flawed, grieving, sometimes kind of dumb, sometimes kind of vengeful, sometimes kind of a jerk, probably misunderstood, certainly mistreated, through Joseph, God works out a new ending, an ending that features forgiveness, not vengeance, the building of a nation, not the tearing down of a family, a new beginning, not recrimination, instead reconciliation, renewal, resurrection. It's a story that takes the past and reshapes the it into the future. It's a story that 
takes what has happened and seeks a new way forward, not based in the harms of the past, but in what is going to be happening next. So that no matter the shape that our story has taken in the past, no matter how high the highs or low the lows, or no matter how our story has dragged us around or has beaten us up, no matter what toll has been taken on our hearts, what happens next is a new story, a story that begins with forgiveness and healing. This is the story of Joseph. It's the story of Israel. It's the story through Israel, through Jesus Christ, of all the world. This is the story of every single human who has done something, has received some harm, has perpetrated harm, and yet is able to wake up again each and every day with a new beginning. This is a story that this world needs right now. With all of the divisions, all the hate, all the hurt that is being played out every day in the lives of our citizens on the streets, in the lives of Black people in our culture, immigrants seeking a new place to live, in the lives of individuals who have broken hearts and broken relationships, in each and every one of these human lives, in these human stories, God enters in through baptism and offers a new beginning so that each and every day our story begins again, not as a repetition of what has been, but as an anticipation of what could be. This is God's story. And through God, it's your story. Thanks be to God. Amen.